Hey you guys, welcome back to Tomes of Terror, doing another book review today. So some of you guys might remember a while back, I don't remember how long ago it was, it was quite a while ago. I did actually read and review um, and actually uh, really, really loved a 2016 murder mystery that was called Magpie Murders by the British author Anthony Horowitz, who is very, very prolific. He doesn't just write novels, he also writes uh, for British TV, like he wrote for Midsummer Murders and like a bunch of big, you know, mystery TV shows over there. So I'm pretty sure that I mentioned in that first review that there was actually kind of like a sequel to Magpie Murders, um, which came out in 2020 and which I was really interested in reading. So then we jump ahead to a couple weeks ago, you know, summer of 2023 is when I'm recording this, and I was wandering around a Books A Million uh, one Saturday afternoon when I came across this right here, this hardback copy of the very sequel that I was talking about, which is called Moonflower Murders. And I think it was only like five bucks or something like that. It was in like the front bargain section. And I was like, ooh, and as you know, I got all excited because I was like, oh my God, I read Magpie Murders and I loved it so much. And I have a paperback version of that. So yeah, I actually do have a physical copy of the book this time, you guys. I didn't actually put it in the, I, I tried to take a picture of it with the, um, to put in the thumbnail, but it's like, it just kept glaring like in the light and everything. And I was just like, fuck it. I'll just put like a digital one in there like usual. But I do actually, have the book this time I didn't read it on Kindle Unlimited and that's just because I found it like I said in the bargain section and I had been wanting to read it and it was super cheap so I was just kind of like hooray so I just uh, bought it you know what I mean now I have to say that I loved this book every bit as much as the first one which was magpie murders uh it is structured similarly but it's a whole new story technically it's stories because it's kind of it has the same like book within a book format as magpie murders did which like i said if you want to go back and watch that review like where i kind of talked about that and it does have like some kind of crucial references to the events of the first novel although i will say that you don't necessarily have to have read magpie murders first like to get into moonflower murders and like understand what's going on but I actually would recommend doing that because there are you know several connective threads like I said you don't you can enjoy this on its own like as a standalone but I think it's like a much better experience if you read both of them and really they're both so good that it's like why wouldn't you want to um I mean I had a really good time with both of them so so much like the magpie murders uh the first and last you know like long sections of moonflower murders are told from the first person POV of the book editor Susan Ryland. Now, after the horrible shit that happened at the end of the first novel, which, like I said, if you haven't read it, I don't really want to spoil it, um, her life has kind of gone off in a different direction a little bit. Uh, she actually no longer works as a book editor, and she's actually moved from her home in London to Crete, and she's running a hotel with her longtime boyfriend, and uh, Andreas. Now, she likes it, like she's having a good time and Crete is beautiful and everything like that, but she still still feels like something is missing in her life and she kind of misses England a little bit and she misses her former work because she was really into reading and she was really into being a book editor. And she isn't, also there's kind of a thing where she isn't entirely certain uh, that she wants to stay with Andreas. Even though she still loves him dearly, um, she's kind of like at a crossroads a little bit. So into this... I guess what you call like a quagmire of dissatisfaction and ambiguity like going on in her life so arrives something of kind of like a blast from the past I guess we had thought that Susan uh, was done with her very cantankerous and also now very dead uh, prize author Alan Conway who was a character in the last novel um, but it would appear that he is not entirely done with her uh, even if only in a very indirect way even though he's like I said pretty dead. So what happens? Susan is contacted, or she's approached actually in person in um, on Crete by an English couple who are named Lawrence and Pauline uh, Trahern. And they own this kind of fancy hotel in Sussex, which is called Branlow Hall. Now they tell her, you know, eight years ago, uh, this man named Frank Paris was horribly, horribly murdered in his room at this hotel. He was like actually beaten to death with a hammer. Now his body, it turned out, was discovered like right in the middle of the wedding of their daughter, Cecily, um, which was actually being held on the hotel's grounds, you know, on the premises. Now the thing about it, this murder was apparently solved almost immediately. 
So the culprit was ostensibly uh, this employee at the hotel who was like this Romanian guy with a very long criminal record whose name was uh, Stefan. Stefan Kadrescu is, I think, you how you pronounce his last name. I mean, like, there was a ton of evidence against him. So, like, the victim's blood is found in his room. Like, um, he had supposedly stole some money from the victim, and they found that in his room, like, stuffed in his mattress or something. Um, his fingerprints were on the doorknob of the room that the guy was in, which was room 12. And also, the night desk clerk thought that he saw Stefan, because, like I said, he knew him because he worked there, like, kind of creeping toward where the spot where the crime occurred. You know what I mean? And as if that wasn't damning enough, uh, Stefan actually confessed to the crime. So he was summarily in prison. So he's in jail. Um, so, you know, whole case open and shut, or at least so it seemed. Cecily Trahern, though, the daughter, you know, of the hotel owners, she actually never believed that Stefan was guilty. And she evidently found confirmation of this belief in a very unlikely place. It was actually in a book by Alan Conway, who, like I said, is the author you know, that was in the first novel. It was one of his books, like his Atticus Pund series, Pund, or it has an umlaut, so it's like the German pronunciation, but that's like, uh, that's one of his names. So one of his like big detective novels, which like I said, was kind of like a big, yeah, which Susan edited, you know what I mean? So the book that was called, actually called Atticus Pund Takes the Case, right? Now, Alan Conway, it should be noted, had stayed at Branlow Hall after the Frank murder took place like eight years ago and actually loosely based his novel, Moonflower Murders, on it. And he actually used a bunch of the real people involved, like, as characters in the book. Um, you know, he changed their names and stuff, but they were still, like, pretty identifiable. So, well, like, a lot of the people uh, that worked at the, at the uh, hotel were, like, really pissed off because he had stayed there, and he's like, oh, I totally won't write a book about this place. But then he did, and... Well, a lot of the um, depictions of the people, and like I said, they were pretty identifiable, were uh, really not all that flattering. So people were really not um, too happy with the dude, you know? So after she read the novel, Cecily called her parents, who I think were like vacationing abroad or something. And she was like kind of panicking. And she's like, I'm sure now that Stefan didn't kill Frank Paris. And she's like, I'm going to send you guys a copy of this book. Cause there was like a whole thing with distribution and like, it was hard to get hold of and stuff like that. It's like not important. So she's like, I'm going to send you guys a copy of this book so you can see for yourself, like what I figured out by reading this. The implication here being that Alan Conway, the author knew who killed Frank but had like encoded the information in the book for some reason, instead of like telling the police what he knew. So, you know, so there's kind of like a mystery of like why he would have done that. Now, the mystery of this one though, is that not too long after Cecily made this phone call, she completely disappeared. So the Trahern's, her parents who own the hotel, they suspect that Cecily perhaps knew too much about the Frank Paris case and subsequently vanished because of it. And the cops are not really being a big help in this regard. So the parents are just really desperate for answers. So they offer to pay Susan, the book editor, 10,000 pounds if she'll actually come to the hotel and interview all the, all the people there and read through the book to find out what it was that Cecily discovered in there, like whatever clue like she figured out. Obviously, they can't talk to Alan Conway himself because he's dead, uh, but they figure that his editor, Susan Ryland, is the next best thing because she was more familiar with his work than anybody. So Susan, very reluctantly, uh, kind of agrees to this mission. She's not super happy about it. Uh, it's mostly because she needs the money, like to fix up some stuff around her own hotel, like uh, back in Crete. She's actually not really sure how much help she's going to be. She's like, I'm not a detective and that's not, this isn't really my area of expertise, you know what I mean? But she is actually kind of willing to give it a shot, you know. So Susan goes to Branlow Hall and starts meeting, you know, just the vast array of suspects that are there, all of whom, you know, just like is the case in a lot of these kind of mysteries, uh, all of whom seem to have something to hide. So she spends quite a while kind of like gathering information about the murder of Frank Paris and the disappearance of Cecily Trahern. And then she decides that she's like, well, I think now that I've kind of gathered all this information and interviewed all these people, now it's time for me to like revisit Moonflower Murders, the novel that Alan Conway wrote, which she ha actually hadn't read for several years. So she needed to like reread it to like familiarize herself with it. So at this point in the book, just like happened in Magpie Murders, we delve into Alan Conway's like fictional mystery story, 
which is somewhat inspired by the real murder of Frank Paris in the frame story, but is also pretty different. Like the book within a book, which actually has its own title page, its own publication credits, its own page numbering, like right in the middle of this big book right here. It's set in 1953 and it tells the story of this kind of famous American actress whose name is Melissa James. And she bought this charming hotel, which is based on Brainlow Hall, but it's called the Moonflower. And it's actually in Devon in the story. But eventually she gets strangled to death in her bedroom by an unknown assailant. So just as in the main frame story, like everybody surrounding the fictional murder is like sketchy as fuck. And many of them had motive to bump off Melissa James. So this story is actually like really fun also like in its own right. It's different enough from the real murder in the frame story to make it its own thing. But because you know that there's like a clue or clues about the real murder buried in there somewhere, you end up kind of like reading it with sort of like an eagle eye to try to figure out what information it was that Cecily read in there that maybe perhaps might have gotten her killed. So like I said, I mean, Moonflower Murders is every bit as fun and every bit as satisfying as Magpie Murders was. And I liked in this one that you actually got to spend a lot more time with the main character, Susan, at the beginning of the book as she started like kind of diving into her investigation. Um, you know, since the fictional Alan Conway book doesn't actually start until I think like a little bit past the halfway mark. Because I think in Magpie Murders, you know, you only had like a chapter or two with Susan and then it delved into the fictional mystery and then you went back to the end. Now, just like the previous book, um, the resolution also of both mysteries is very twisty and very surprising, but once revealed, like makes complete and total sense. Like, oh yeah, obviously that's like the only way that it could have been, even though you didn't really guess it ahead of time. I mean, I certainly didn't. So I mentioned this too in my review of Magpie Murders. Please know going in that the book is essentially going to switch gears and kind of go off in a totally different, but somewhat related direction, like a d related story in about the middle. So it might take a little while to get reoriented, like when the fictional mystery begins, and also when you return to the frame story, like toward the end, like in the last third. But I mean, this wasn't really an issue for me because like I said, I'd read Magpie Murders and I did know that this was structured similarly to that. So I was like expecting it. Now I do admit that I had to like kind of flip back a couple of times to like remember some details from the main frame story, like once I returned to it, like toward the end of the book. So yeah, I mean, if you love both just old school, Mur like Agatha Christie style murder mysteries and also modern mysteries, this is kind of like, it's really good because it's like a two for one. You kind of get both things like in the same story. So yeah, so just like Magpie, I would totally recommend this one as well. It's kind of full of all the same really entertaining like plot twists and all the red herrings and stuff that you would want like in a classic mystery. And I also really like the character of Susan and also the fictional detective Atticus Pund uh, who's, you know, in the fictional part of the book. I mean, they're both very appealing characters. They're very well delineated. They're very sympathetic. And they're, you know, both struggling to solve their respective puzzles. And they're, like I said, the puzzles are sort of related, but they're different enough that they're kind of their own thing, but also kind of the same thing, if that makes any sense. You know, it's really easy to see why this book, um, you know, just like Magpie, got so many rave reviews. It was all, you know, I think it was on the New York Times list and all that kind of stuff. And it's really easy to see why it's just really, really fun. It's just a complete blast. I had a really good time with this and I'm really, really glad that I found it. Uh, really, really glad that I bought it and that I have you know, a nice hardback copy of it because I don't usually get that anymore. So that'll do it for this Tomes of Terror. Thank you very much for watching. Please remember to like, share, comment, and all of that other kind of stuff. It's always good for the algorithm. And I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye.